This morning, as you may observe from the text, we're looking at the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. It just may be the greatest, if not the greatest, one of the greatest conversions that ever happened in the history of the world. I want you to imagine something this morning. I want you to imagine that the most heinous enemy of the United States who has nothing in mind but a desire to destroy this country says, I want to be a citizen of the United States. Let me give you a name or two. They're both dead. Osama bin Laden. Or Abu Baker al-Baghdadi. I suspect when I mention those kinds of names that you would say, no way. Here's somebody that's whole desire is that they want to destroy this country. He certainly wouldn't want to be a citizen here. And then if you probably were honest, you'd probably put on the end of that, and we don't want him here anyway. Okay, that's a present day illustration. Imagine that you're a Christian living in the first century, and Saul of Tarsus says, I want to become a Christian. The very idea to all of us would be something like this. That's totally inconceivable, never going to happen, no use to think about it. In fact, the typical Christian's response would be something like this sarcastic statement, yeah, right. And any Jewish religious leader's response in the first century would have been a skeptical, there is no way in the world that's going to happen. And yet, today's lesson, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. I want you to open your Bibles with me, if you will, please, to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, but then I'd like for you, if you have your Bible, now if you're using your uh, iPad or something, you're going to have to do some jumping. We're going to look at chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26 of the book of Acts. First of all, we begin today with Saul's terroristic persecution of the church and Christians in the first century. In our last lesson at the martyrdom of Stephen, we were introduced to Saul. Acts chapter 7 if you'll look right at the very end of that chapter, verse 58, the Bible says this. They cast him uh, out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. This young Jewish zealot was trained by the great Pharisee Educator Gamaliel, Acts chapter 22 and verse 3. We're introduced to him at the end of chapter 5 in the book of Acts. When he, uh, Gamaliel, we're introduced to, as he tried to caution the Sanhedrin when they're going ballistic toward Peter and John, he says, you need to be careful. What if this is from God? Watch out. In chapter 5, verse 34, one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and he commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Here's this member of the Sanhedrin, religiously a Pharisee, one of the great respected leaders of the law of Moses, who held strict observance to the law of Moses. And he's saying to this Sanhedrin group, you better be careful. As I mentioned, Saul was present at Stephen's stoning and consented to his death. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Look at the beginning of chapter 8. It makes a simple statement. Now Saul was consenting to his death. He's just as eager to see Stephen dead as those who were throwing the stones at him. Later in chapter 22 and verse 20, as he told of his conversion... He acknowledged that he was there when Stephen was stoned. And he emphasized, uh, he, 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 he said, here's what I told the Lord on the road to Damascus. 
He said, when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. I was there. I was giving my consent to it. I was all for Stephen being murdered. He became the leading persecutor of the cause of Christ in the first century. Again, notice with me chapter 8, verse 1. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Here is the leading antagonist, terrorist, against the church and Christians. Saul had left Judea, and he went to Syria. He was leaving the country, going to another country, and seeking Christians everywhere. Look at Acts chapter 9 now, if you will, verses 1 and 2. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The Jewish leaders gave their permission. And here was Saul, this bulldog terrorist, trying to root out Christian men and women to arrest, to imprison, and to have them murdered. He was the Jewish leader's facilitator to carry out destruction of the church and of Christians. By the way, his persecution was so much more severe and dangerous than just threats. He was eager to carry out murder. I want to kill every one of them. And like a bloodthirsty animal, he went to the high priest and sought orders that he might go as far as Damascus to arrest Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem. And he was on a mission to eradicate Christianity from the face of the earth. You need to understand the seriousness of what he was planning. Paul explained this mission in chapter 22 and verse 4. He said, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Chapter 26, verse 11. I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. No matter where they are, I want them dead. Later in life, he addressed his murderous attacks against the church. In chapter 22, when Paul had come back at the end of the third missionary journey, he was in Jerusalem, and there was a literal mob going on, and he was arrested. Uh, Paul explained that when that Roman commander had taken custody of him, and he asked to speak to the crowd, Paul explained as he spoke to them about his earlier life. He says this in chapter 22, verses 3 through 5. I'm indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God, as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, and also the high priest bears me witness, and all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them in chains those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. In chapter 22, verse 19, he says further, So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those uh, who believe on you. Later in chapter 26, when Paul stood before King Agrippa, who had come to Caesarea and tried him, he said this, Indeed, I myself thought that I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, this I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue. And, and listen to this next statement. I punished them. I compelled them to blaspheme. It's as if Paul stood in front of Christians. Can you imagine being in this situation? Paul stood in front of Christians and threatened them. It's almost like he grabbed them by the throat and he said, you blaspheme Jesus Christ or I'm going to kill you right now. 
Can you imagine that happening to you? He says, while this, occupy, or while this occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, finishing Acts 26. Later, when he wrote the Galatian Christians, he told about this earlier part of his life in Judaism. And he said in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1, You've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. I was a Jew of Jews. I opposed Jesus. I opposed the new covenant. I opposed the church. I hated all of them. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, and it's an interesting chapter talking about resurrection. But in verse 9, Paul says, I'm the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. I don't deserve to be an apostle. And later he told Timothy of how grateful he was to be a minister, although he said that privilege was so undeserved. He said, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. Now I have a question for you. You take all those things that we read about and what Paul said about himself, and I ask you, what Christian could possibly think about this man becoming a Christian? What Christian in the first century is going to say, Saul of Tarsus is going to be converted? What Christian could possibly trust this man if he supposedly was converted? Well, you remember what happened. Saul was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Now, I want you to try to get a picture just a moment. I want you to picture that Saul is coming from Jerusalem toward Damascus and what's going on in his mind and his head and what's his attitude. And then I want you to think about when the Lord speaks to him and blinds him, now what's his attitude? Saul is this focused, driven, determined man. I'm going to find and I'm going to arrest these Christians and I'm going to take them to Jerusalem to be imprisoned. That's on the way. In an instant, he is perplexed and fearful and confused and cowering. And his whole belief system is instantaneously turned upside down. You talk about being shaken to the core. Now, this is recorded in Acts 9, verses 3 to 7. I'm going to read for time here this morning, Acts 22. So if you'll turn to Acts chapter 22, by the way, it's also, I think, upon the screen here. But Acts chapter 22, verses 6 to 11, listen as Paul explains what happened on the road to Damascus. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and uh, were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise, and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Now, there's other information in these other two texts that I'm going to give you as we talk about the events. By the way, one other passage, let me just mention, 1 Corinthians 15. You remember when Paul there talked, or 1 Corinthians 9 rather, Paul talked about being an apostle. He said, am I not an apostle? Listen to this. Have I not seen Christ our Lord? What's he talking about? He saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. The facts about these events. He's on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. He's nearing the city. And at noon, a bright light, brighter than the sun, shone upon him. It was like the light of a bolt of lightning. 
And he heard Jesus speaking in Hebrew, asking him, Why are you persecuting me? His friends saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. And Saul, not knowing who was speaking, said, Who are you, Lord? Caution. I've seen commentators, I've heard people say, Well, Saul knew who Jesus was here, and he's, he's saying, I respect you as Lord. Oh, no. He doesn't even know who it is at this point. What he's saying is, I don't know who you are, but you're a lot bigger than I am. Lord, in the sense of greatness above me, is what he's talking about here. And Jesus' reply was, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. You are fighting and scratching and kicking with all your might against the will of God. And it's time for you to stop it. Saul trembling asked, what must I do, Lord? And Jesus told him to rise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. In chapter 22, verse 10, uh, there you'll be told of all things that are appointed for you to do. And in chapter 26, verses 16 to, th uh, to, to 23, uh, he's talk, uh, it's, it's to told about that he had a purpose, that he's going to be a light to the Gentiles, etc. And because Saul was blinded by the light, his friends led him by the hand into the city of Damascus, and this heart-stricken, remorseful man went into the city and for three days and three nights did not eat one bite, did not drink one drink. And then the Lord in a vision called Ananias, a devout Jew, to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and to seek Saul who was praying. He told him that Saul had seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming to him, laying his hands on him and restoring his sight. Imagine you being Ananias. Ananias, this guy Saul of Tarsus is over in the house of Judas. He's blind. I want you to go there and teach him the gospel. What would you have said? <laughs> Ananias responded to the Lord, I've heard about this man and how he perse persecuted Christians in, in Jerusalem. And I've heard that he's coming here to Damascus with authority from the chief priest to do the same thing. Lord, you want me to go talk to him? And the Lord said, I have a mission for Saul to bear the name of Christ to Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. This former persecutor of the church is going to become my apostle. This former persecutor of the church is going to face intense persecution himself. Ananias obediently got up and went to Straight Street and laid his hands on Saul and restored his sight and then called upon this penitent believer to arise and to be baptized. And watch this. Saul did not argue about it. He did it immediately. He arose and was baptized, and his sins were washed away in baptism as he called upon the name of the Lord for salvation. He was not a Christian on the road to Damascus. He was not saved before his baptism. Somebody says, well, why did Ananias call him Brother Saul? Not because he's a brother in Christ, but because he's a fellow Jew. Saul was certainly a penitent believer. The Lord had appeared to him, blinded him, and shocked him to his core. His action of not eating and drinking certainly indicated remorse, didn't it? It indicated repentance. And Ananias restored his sight and then told him that the Lord had a mission for him and called upon him to arise and to be baptized and to have his sins washed away. Saul arose and was baptized. He realized how sinful he was and how salvation could only be received through the awesome Lord Jesus and his blood. Afterward, Saul received nourishment and was strengthened. He fellowshiped with the Christians in Damascus and immediately, watch this, on the road, Jesus is a fake. Jesus is a fraud. This is not the will of heaven. He's struck blind. The Lord speaks to him. And three days later after he's baptized, Saul is standing in the very city where he went to persecute Christians and proclaiming Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's incredible. 
the instantaneous change that occurred. The people in Damascus were amazed because they knew this is the, the, the persecutor. Uh, th this is the terrorist who's come to town. But Saul increased in strength and confounded the Jews who did not believe in Jesus. There are some events after his conversion that I want to highlight this morning that are important. Here are some of them very briefly. Number one, the Christians in Damascus, uh, remember? Somebody hates America, I want to be a citizen of America. How are we going to respond? Saul of Tarsus wants to be a Christian? Yeah, right. It is fascinating that the Christians in Damascus received him as a brother. A few days later, the Jews plotted to kill Saul. They watched every gate of the city to make sure we're not going to let him out of the city. We're going to kill him. But his new Christian brethren helped him to escape that plot to kill him. And at night, they took him and they lowered him out a window over the side of the wall of the city and he escaped. When did this event occur? It's interesting. Some commentators will say maybe three years later. Oh, no. This is something that happened very soon, just days after his conversion. Why would that occur? Well, think about it, folks. His former allies, his Jewish comrades, those who were in such great opposition to Jesus and Christians in the church, they're now enraged. Why? Well, our Goliath, our giant, to promote our cause, has become a traitor to our cause. We've got to see that he's dead too. The Lord worked with Saul to prepare him to be that great apostle that he became. After the Jews persecuted him and he fled the city, he went to Arabia. He talks about this in Galatians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. He said, The Lord sent him to Arabia to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I didn't immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. By the way, uh, you're going to see in a moment, this is about three years later when he finally comes back and then goes to Jerusalem. Here's what's interesting, though. The Christians who are in Jerusalem heard, <laughs> you can imagine that, they heard that Saul of Tarsus has been converted. You know what's fascinating? At that point, they didn't doubt it. They didn't say, well, it didn't happen. Rather, they rejoiced. Galatians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. They glorified God in me, Paul says. But he returned back to Damascus and then made a trip to Jerusalem. And this is where it gets interesting. Because the leery reaction of the brethren toward him. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, After three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. By the way, why is Paul talking about this? I didn't confer with uh, apostles and I didn't see but two of them when I went back to Jerusalem. What's the point? What Paul is affirming is, I didn't get the message that I have been preaching from the other apostles. I didn't learn this from men. I went off into Arabia and the Lord worked with me and taught me. And I know what the will of God is. I was given it by the Lord. Now, turn with me to Acts 9. And starting at verse 26, let's read just a few verses. When Saul comes back to Jerusalem. Remember, you're a Christian living in Jerusalem. First of all, they glorified God when he's over in Damascus and we've heard he's converted. Uh-oh. Saul's coming back to town. Mm. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. Can I, can I give you a, a present-day explanation of this? He tried to place membership with the church at Jerusalem. But they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Something in that last three years had caused them to say, we don't believe it's real. And that's where, bless his heart, 
Old Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how that he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed with the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. And when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Now, folks, that's the great story of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. But I have a question for you. What does this story mean to you as a Christian? What does this story mean to the congregation here at Washington Avenue? Brethren, we need to read this more than just a bunch of facts. What does it mean? Some great truths of it. Number one. Brethren, people can be totally convinced that doing wrong is right. How many people who've lived have lived doing wrong, opposing the will of God, and all the time totally convinced I'm doing right? Saul of Tarsus is a classic example. Later in chapter 23, when he stood before the council, you remember what he said, men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. You're kidding. Uh, Paul, you mean that back there trying to destroy, kill Christians, hating Christ, rejecting him, trying to destroy the church? You mean you thought you were doing what was right? Absolutely thought I was doing right. Observation number two. Brethren, we never know who has a receptive heart to the gospel and what great things that person may do for the cause of Jesus. I fear many times that we look at somebody and predetermine and prejudge them and say, hmm, he'd never be interested in the gospel. Why, he'd never repent. Why, look at that guy's life. Look at all the sin that he's involved in. He'd never change. Brethren, we don't have the right to predetermine who's going to respond and who's not. Our response is to teach the gospel, to give people the opportunity to hear it, and to respond to it. I ask us, brethren, every one of us, are we willing to have that kind of attitude toward people in sin? That, brethren, is the Christian response and ought to be of every member of the Lord's body. Number three. Conversion can have impact that's incredible. Watch it. Saul was saved. Seething Saul became powerful preaching Paul. You know what that tells us this morning? That one can certainly outlive a past life of sin and become a dynamic child of God. What a conversion! It happened in the first century, it can happen in Evansville, Indiana. Another impact, the gospel message was taught in Jewish synagogues everywhere he traveled. Thirdly, he was a messenger of God for the Gentiles. Fourthly, he took the gospel to the known world at that time. And during his missionary journeys, Paul wrote 14 books of the New Testament, over half of the New Testament, encouraging congregations and individuals to be loyal to Christ and his will. His faith, his life, his heart, his love for the church, and his evangelistic zeal are stamped on almost all the rest of the New Testament after the book of Acts. It is incredible, the impact of his conversion. Brethren, are we willing to give people an opportunity to come to Christ? Are we willing to give sinners the opportunity to repent? Understanding they may have impact on the lives of literally multitudes of people that we'll never meet. Lastly, this morning, I simply observed that later the persecutor became the viciously persecuted the Lord said that was going to happen in Acts 9, 16. I will show him, he said to Ananias, how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. There was the immediate persecution in the city of Damascus when the Jews tried to kill him. There was later 
stoning at Lystra. Uh, opponents who followed him everywhere he went and taught in every synagogue, in every town. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was left for dead outside Lystra. It's horrible what Paul endured, and all because he was converted to Christ. Now this morning, I want to bring this back out of us talking about ourselves and congregationally, and I want to talk to you just a minute in this question. What's your view about Jesus Christ? Do you really believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you? Ladies and gentlemen, here's what I observe. When somebody really gets it, when somebody really understands who Jesus is and really understands that I need Jesus and his blood to wash away my sins, notice the unbaptized need to imitate Saul of Tarsus. What did he do? He didn't sit around and say, well, I'll wait a few months till I decide if this is important. No, no, no. He didn't say, I'll wait a week or two and then I'll do it. Notice it, brethren, Saul of Tarsus, when the Lord met him on the road, penitence immediately occurred. Faith occurred and grew. And when Ananias came and said, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Notice, he didn't argue. He didn't delay. He immediately said, I am ready to be baptized because I want the salvation that Jesus can give me in Jesus only. I ask you this morning, if you're not a Christian, will you have the heart and the faith of Saul of Tarsus? Sometimes people say, I don't know if I can be forgiven or not. Listen, folks. If God would forgive the greatest persecutor of the church, a terrorist against the church, he'll forgive any one of us. Amen? Sure he will. This morning I call upon you, if you've not been baptized into Christ, to come in faith with a penitent heart to confess that I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The water's ready, clothes are ready. We invite you to come and let Jesus save you by the power of his blood as you're baptized for salvation. Would you come while we stand and sing?